Jack from Motorboat and Yachting here. First of all, I want to thank you for subscribing to the Motorboat and Yachting channel and also for sending in so many great questions via the post that I put online last week, both on YouTube and on Facebook. We got a great response to both. So I've whittled down the questions and I'm going to answer some of my favourites. So let's get going. Number one, what would your perfect boat be? That's from Nick Harding. Well, it's hard to put my finger on one particular boat. I've tested over 250 now. Um, but if the finance is allowed, which sadly they don't, I'd look for something that is between 60 and 70 feet. Semi-displacement, so I have the ability to travel, say, 1,500 nautical miles, something like that at displacement speeds, but also can achieve higher speeds for when I just want to get a move on, do 20, 25 knots something like that, something very well built, something that's capable enough to take you long distances that you can live aboard. So it would be something in the style of a Fleming 65, a Hardy 65 or the Vikram 67, something like that, that style of boat. That's what appeals to me. Lars Edstrom asks, can you include more people in your test to give a broader perspective? That's a very good point. It's something that isn't going to be particularly easy for us to make happen, but when we can, I will try. I've done tests with my wife before when we've been allowed to have boats for a longer period. We did one on the Galleon 335 HTS last year, in fact. And if I do do that again, I'll be sure to make sure that I get her inputs as well to get a different perspective. That's a good idea. Where has been your best location to test boats? That's from Deborah Everard. A uh, test that really sticks in my mind for location is one I did of the Prestige 680 a few years ago. We picked the boat up in Croatia near Dubrovnik and we took it to Kotor in Montenegro, the Bay of Kotor, and it is just the most amazing scenery that I've ever seen. Um, I, wasn't, I hadn't been to Montenegro before and it just blew me away. And this particular spot is an area that will stick in my mind um, forever. And I, I look forward to getting back there as soon as I can. Um, Dog1122 asks, can you please do more overnight tests? Yes, absolutely. That's something I'm really keen to do. And we at the magazine really want to do as well. Um, it's not always easy. The boats that we test they're generally owned by customers. They might be going to a dealer for stock, but generally they are, they've already got a name on them. They're owned by somebody and for understandable reasons, they don't particularly want strangers staying on board, putting hours on the engine, sleeping in the beds, etc. But there have been times when we've been able to do that and you can see our 24 hour tests on the YouTube channel. There is a playlist of them. And every time I test a boat, I request, can, can we stay on board? It's not always possible. But when it is, we will absolutely do it. And there's been good buy-in from a lot of the manufacturers as well who understand that it's a better review. We learn a lot more, they get a more balanced review, and it's better for, for you guys as well because you're seeing the boat being used as a potential owner would use it. So yes, we'll try our best to do more of those. Have you ever crashed a boat you've been testing? That's from Tom Riley. Thankfully not, touch wood. Um, but I did have a mishap with um, my father's boat when I was... In my early teens I was taking it into the mooring in pool and uh, I swung it round to head forward into the berth and just caught the aft end of the tube on an upturned outboard on the skeg and it, it burst the tube so that was embarrassing luckily my dad took it with with good humor and, uh, and let me back on the helm reasonably soon afterwards. Can you do more reviews of affordable boats and do you get paid to do reviews that's from Keith Bucknell. Yes We've always got an eye on reviewing affordable boats. We try our best. We cover a big remit in the magazine and on the channel. We test boats from you know, 20 feet up to 120 feet. So it's hard to please everybody. Uh, in the magazine, uh, we have a used boat section run by Nick Burnham or Aquaholic, as you guys may know him on here. Um, and he's looking there at the used boat market. And also we have a section called Find Me Er, where we challenge him to find a certain type of boat for a, a certain reasonable budget. Um, so we do make an attempt to test some more affordable boats. We're always on the on the lookout to do so. Uh, and if you look around the channel, you can see we have used boat reviews on there, and all of those boats are generally more affordable than the new uh, new stuff that we test. Do we get paid to do reviews? Absolutely not. That is at the heart of what most boats and yachting is about. We're completely independent, so we are free to say what we like about the boats we test, and that will never change. 
For a first time buyer, what size of boat would you recommend for two people who have had some training? That's from Ray Taylor. With modern technology on boats, I'm thinking joysticks, etc. here, it is easier for people who are new to boating to control ever bigger boats. But I would still recommend starting smaller, it just makes life easier because it's not all about handling a boat, it's about crewing it as well and handling the lines and getting it into the mooring. And if there's two of you, then the smaller the boat, the easier that is. So I'd suggest something like a Sea Line C330 or a Geno Leader 33. They're relatively good value and they're also going to be pretty easy to control if you're new to boating, but they're big enough that you're not going to get caught out if it kicks up a bit weather-wise and it gives you enough space to expand your horizons when you're a bit more confident. I've never driven a boat before. Is there training available? Absolutely. There are training bases all over the country. I would go to the RYA website where you'll find links to uh, training centres near you and then they will train you right from the basics up to your yacht master. So yes, absolutely. If you've never driven a boat before, you can get training and learn how to do it. Do you prefer shaft drives or pods? That's from Jason Lees. I don't think it's quite as black and white as choosing shafts or pods. It's the whole package of the boat and sometimes boats are designed with pods, not just for dynamics, but because of the packaging of the boat. Because the engines are set further aft in the boat on a pod drive boat, it means you get a lot more space inside the hull for accommodation. So that really changes the way a boat fits together and like for like pods or shafts, you may find you get a lot more living space on a boat with pods just because simply of that packaging. The way to drive, shaft drives generally, as long as the whole styles are the same, planing or shaft drive, they feel pretty similar. Pods, there is a bit more variation, depends on whether the boat's been designed to have pods from the beginning or whether maybe it's designed to have shafts and pods. Um, I wouldn't say that I could nail down a particular preference. Uh, it's completely dependent on the type and style of boat. One key thing about pods, I'd say, is what it's done is allowed people with a less experience to buy bigger boats more quickly. Because if you have no experience of traditional shaft drives where you're using throttles and bow thrusters, stern thruster, it's more natural just to use a joystick. If you're coming in completely cold into boating, then a joystick is more natural than using the two throttles. So I see that as a positive for, for IPS. But with training, you can get just as competent with shaft drives. And of course, now shaft drives are available with joysticks, so they do much the same as, as pods uh, if you want them to. What do you think is the ideal boat for British waters? And my eight-year-old, who has watched your videos numerous times, asks, what's your favourite boat that you've completed a 24-hour test on? It's from Nick Bennett. Well, thank you to you as well and your eight-year-old for watching the videos. We appreciate it. Ideal boat for British waters. Well, something with a roof for a start, um, because even in the summer, the threat of rain is never too far away. It also means in the winter, you, you can use the boat all year round. And if I was buying a boat to keep in the UK, that's what I wouldn't be able to do. I'd want to be able to use it as often as possible, as easily as possible. So something with a sunroof that can offer you protection, but exposure if you if you want it, if the weather suits, then that would be good for me. And I, you know, I'd say something sort of 40 to 50 feet because then you're guaranteed to get into marinas as long as they're not too busy. And it makes it easy to handle if you want to go out on your own. My personal preference. An overnight test that sticks to my mind would be the Hardy 65, which we tested during the piece from the east. It, it came in March with snow and stormy weather. And the night before we were supposed to take the boat from Portsmouth to Jersey. Um, the forecast was for force eight, force nine in the channel. So it felt responsible to do that, given it wasn't you know, an essential trip. We still tested the boat. We stayed on board in Portsmouth. And then the next morning we went round the Isle of Wight and over to Poole. Um, not quite as daring as crossing the channel, but we still saw some pretty serious conditions as we went around the south side of the Isle of Wight uh, and across Poole Bay. And the boat just handled it brilliantly. But it was really good to test a boat for that period in proper conditions uh, and really test its metal. So it would probably be that one. What licenses do you need to test boats? It's from Duncan McDonald. Uh, you don't need a special license to test boats as a journalist. I have the same qualifications that you as a, a boater would get through uh, the RYA. Um, what I would say is that I've now got experience of testing 250 odd boats and it's that comparison and uh, the context that I have when I'm testing them that allows me to give the opinions I do in the written reviews and in the YouTube reviews. What boat do you have? We have a Geno Cap Camerat 65WA, 
uh, with a 140 horsepower Suzuki outboard. She's about 20 years old, keep her in pool, and absolutely perfect for that area because um, you can get out to the beach, you know, should be about 30, 35 knots, perfect for water sports and swimming and lunching, anchoring in, uh, in the bays around pool, but also a shallow enough draft and obviously you can lift the outboards, you can get to the depths of, of Pool har Harbour, which is you know, a really wonderful place to, to keep a boat. Um, so she's absolutely perfect for her needs. My parents have a Beneteau Swift Trawler 34. She's 10 years old. Uh, they keep her in Portugal. She's got a single 425 horsepower Cummins diesel engine. And whenever I'm not boating for work, uh, my wife and I try and get out there as often as we can to do a bit of pleasure boating. How did you get into testing reviewing boats and what does your job comprise of? Tim Sinclair. I've loved boats from the moment my parents bought a 17 foot white shark back when I was, I was eight years old and they kept it in pool and I was hooked from the second we did our first trip out through Pool Harbour um, and I've loved all things boats ever since. In my teenage years I read motorboat and yachting and I set my sights on working on the magazine one day. I wasn't sure how I'd do it or what I'd do but I just wanted to write for the, for the magazine and test boats for them. And then I bumped into the editor Hugo Andre, who's still the editor now at the London Boat Show when I was 16, and he agreed to let me do some work experience on the magazine while I was still at school, which I did, and then we stayed in touch, and I was about to go to university, and I got an email from Hugo saying, um, there's a staff writer role coming up on the magazine, if you'd be interested. I bit his hand off, moved to London, joined the, the staff, and tested my first boat, which is a Trader 42, uh, one month later, and the rest, as they say, is history. And what does the job comprise of? Well, I'm deputy editor. Um, the major part of my job is testing the boats, um, writing the reviews, and obviously doing the YouTube reviews as well. And I also edit the videos. Organising the boat test take, takes up a lot of my time. It's not easy to pin these boats down and you have to organise a skipper and a photographer. So that's a bit of a logistical nightmare and regularly travel uh, to Europe and the States to, to do the testing. But I also run sections of the magazine. I run the new boat section. I run our, our boat section. I contribute to the, the website, uh, represent the magazine at boat shows and also key launches of new boats as well. So plenty to keep me busy. What is the favourite rib you have tested? That's from Jack Swan. Um, I have a real soft spot for ribs, as I said. Uh, we had one when I was younger, the one I burst. It was a 26-foot Cobra with a 200-horsepower Mercury outboard. And it was the boat we had after the White Shark, actually, and I just loved it. It was so fast, so much fun, so versatile. So a real soft spot for ribs. And a test that really sticks in my mind would be when my wife and I took um, a Goldfish 29 and a Hunton 1005 from Poole over to Alderney in the Channel Islands and back in a day. We basically blasted over there for lunch and came back. Just what those boats are designed for, and the goldfish particularly impressed me. Um, it really made a trip like that, which is you know, pretty significant, 60 odd miles for an open 29 foot boat, feel so comfortable. And we got back feeling like we'd just been for a blast round the bay. It really was impressive how it handled those conditions and made a 120 mile round trip seem perfectly possible. So um, the goldfish 29 sticks in my mind. Can you show the crew quarters in more detail during reviews F from Philip Leboa? Uh, yes, absolutely, we can. We're going to try and show every single area of the boats we test. Uh, we always do. We have two types of video review, as you've probably seen. We have our walk around tests, or walk around reviews, I should say, where we stick the GoPro on and literally go around the boat uh, looking at every single area. That's generally what we do at, at boat shows. And then we have the full sea trials. We, we have a lot to do in a day. We have to do a full photo shoot for the magazine. I have to get my test figures and then we have to do a full video shoot as well. And we really only have the boats for a day. It's rare that we have them for, for more than that. So we have a lot to cover. No excuse. We will always try and show every area of the boat if we have the time to. Do you think we will see outboards replacing diesel engines on bigger boats? That's from Clayton Wirtz. I don't think we'll see them replacing diesel engines necessarily, but I think you'll be given as option on a lot more boats. Um, if you look at the Cam Boat Show last year, I've never seen so many 40 to 50 foot boats fitted with outboards. They've been doing that in the States for a long, long time, but it really hasn't caught on here in Europe until now. And that's because the outboard technology has really improved the way they look, their efficiency, their performance, their reliability, as well as their software and how easy they are to handle with the addition of joysticks, etc. So yes, I do think we're gonna see more and more outboards being fitted to ever bigger boats. Would you recommend a 40-foot power cat over a 45-foot monohull?
That's a good question. Uh, power cats historically were produced by uh, sailing catamaran manufacturers who would just lop off the mast and call it a power cat. But now more and more brands are building power cats from the ground up, including uh, things like IPS pods, pod drives. So they're improving all the time and this has changed the conversation a little bit. Now there's still the downsides that you get with catamarans, which is obviously they're a lot wider so they might cost more to birth. They generally don't look quite as good as um, a same size monohull, but there are lots of benefits. They're naturally quite stable, um, they're efficient because they're driving two very slender hulls. Obviously you get lots of deck space and you'll generally get at least one cabin that is the equivalent to say a 50 foot monohull on a 40 foot power cat. So there's a lot to like about them, especially if you want to live on board and they give you great autonomy and lots and lots of living space. But as long as you can handle those downsides, then um, I certainly would have no qualms in recommending a power cat of that size. If a yacht has all the latest equipment, what is the largest motorboat that can be handled solo? That's from Philip John Evans. It's a difficult question to answer because it comes down to the experience of the skipper as well and, and the confidence that they would have to handle a boat on their own. I think in terms of handling the boats, um, if it has got, you know, say pod drives or twin shafts, bow thruster, stern thruster, dynamic positioning system, you could handle, you know, something 70, 80 feet on your own in terms of physically manoeuvring it around the marina and driving it. But it's when you come alongside, if you're on your own, that's when it gets difficult, handling those big lines that you would get on something of 70, 80 feet. And then you have to tie on and go and grab the bow line, maybe with the wind blowing it off. So that's what you have to think about. OK, you might get some help from the marina, but you can't guarantee that. So I really want, wouldn't want to be doing that on anything much bigger than 50 feet, personally, if I was on my own, if you're talking a worst case scenario when it comes to weather. If the weather's fine, you've got all that kit, you could handle really quite a big boat on your own, I think. So that's the end of the Q&A. That's 20 questions. Thank you very much for all of them. I'm sorry I couldn't answer them all. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to ask them. Though. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Any tests or videos that I've mentioned during that, I will link to below the video so you can go off and watch them. And, you know, we have a huge archive of videos on the channel. So do trawl through them um, if you're finding yourself twiddling your thumbs at the moment, which a lot of us are. Um, thanks again for watching and look out for new videos coming up soon.